This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. One that everybody wants me. This is my iron. You're gonna acknowledge me. All right, everybody. Welcome to your Monday Night Raw review, the final Monday Night Raw before SummerSlam this Saturday night. And we've got so much to discuss from this show. Some good, some bad, as always, and we're going to get to that in a minute. First and foremost, right off the bat, I want to give a shout out to the newest patron over there on patreon.com slash WWE podcast, and that's Farhan. So Farhan has joined the group, and he is now a part of not just an ad-free listening experience, but also going to be a part of our Discord server chat that's going to take place during SummerSlam this Saturday night. And you can get yourself in that group as well as ad-free and a shout-out, just as you heard, by heading on over to Patreon and getting yourself signed up for just a dollar. It gets you those two benefits and more. There's there's even more for that dollar a month. So we give you a little bang for your buck. Um, Those of you that are on Patreon, we'll be sending out the link to the VIP Discord server, which is the same exact spot that we used last time. If you're new, I'll send the link out anyway, but uh, those of you who are already on Discord, it's going to be using the same exact room we used last time. I don't want to change anything. keeps things simple. So if you want to go ad-free on Apple Podcasts, you can also do that by clicking on the ad-free button right on our page. It gets you uh, three days of free trial. Listen to everything ad-free that you want, and then it's just a $2.99 a month subscription. So not too bad for using your native Apple podcast app and not having to go anywhere. So uh, keep keep here, guys, because during SummerSlam, this is the place you're going to want to be. We've got wall. We're going to have wall to wall coverage. I've got Ashley Mann joining me. Yes, Ashley is going to be coming back to the show Thursday night prior to the SmackDown show for our official SummerSlam preview and predictions, as is customary here on the show. And yes, Friday could be a very, very big day in professional wrestling, which is long believed to be the day that we see CM Punk make his return to professional wrestling on the AEW Dynamite show, Rampage show that's going to be taking place in Chicago Friday night. I'll be watching. I hope you guys will be watching too. Even if you're not a fan of AEW, you're going to want to listen to this pop if CM Punk comes out. Let me tell you, if CM Punk does not come out on AEW Dynamite, the, the, the Chicago crowd may burn down the building. <laughs> and I don't mean to say that in a very tumultuous time. <laughs> uh, sometimes, you know, things can be taken out of context. But in, in a, I guess, a metaphorical sense, they will be very unhappy and, and waiting for CM Punk to make his appearance. And can you imagine that Chicago crowd? It's It's going to be... One of those moments, but hopefully we won't have somebody there in the announce booth to tell us it's a moment and we are smart enough to figure out that it's a moment. So, all right, enough of AEW. I know this is a Monday Night Raw review, but I want to let you guys know if you didn't already that Friday could be a huge day. Yes, SmackDown is on, but I think it's going to be overshadowed if CM Punk makes his return uh, this coming Friday night. So um, again, Ashley will be joining me. Thursday for the preview and prediction show. And then uh, on Saturday, following immediately following the pay-per-view, I'll be giving you guys a, a wrap-up and review show of SummerSlam. And again, that will hopefully be, it's not 100% confirmed, but uh, I'm, I, have, I have confidence that it's going to be with the Botch Guy. YouTube's the Botch Guy. Uh, go give him a subscription too, by the way. Great guy. Okay, let's talk about Monday Night Raw. As we plug our schedule for the SummerSlam week here on the WWE podcast. So, all right, let's talk Monday Night Raw. And overall, I enjoyed the show. I thought it was, I thought it was well done. Um, I, I wouldn't give it a glorious review, but it has shown improvement over the last two weeks. I know last, last week, many people thought of Monday Night Raw as just kind of a, a show that was there. It didn't have a whole lot to write home about. And understandably, 
You know, uh, when you have so many shows between the pay-per-views and you have three hour shows you need to produce between pay-per-views, there's a lot of content and the go home show should be hotter by definition. And I think this one was, I think it accomplished what it needed to on, uh, on many levels. And you know what? Let's start with the Goldberg spear on Bobby Lashley. The only good thing coming out of this is that tells me, at least in WWE land and their booking logic, that Goldberg is not going to win Saturday night at SummerSlam. It's not a hard and fast, always rule that the person who gets the one up on the show before the pay-per-view is the one that's going to end up losing at the pay-per-view, but I th- it's a general rule and, and a good guide if you're going to be making picks for a pay-per-view that the person who gets the one up typically is the one that loses at the pay-per-view. So there is evidence to support our hopefulness <laughs> that Goldberg does not win the championship at SummerSlam. <clears throat> I honestly don't know how the crowd is cheering for Goldberg at this point. You know, I was sitting there as Goldberg's making his entrance and I'm thinking to myself, trying to put myself in the shoes of the people in the audience, trying to put my brain in their bodies and and trying to understand why they're cheering for this guy. And I, I think I've got it figured out. It's been a long time since we've been in front of, uh, in a wrestling event. Right, And the same thing for the wrestlers. It's been a long time since they've been in front of fans. There's a lot of pandemic frustration and being cooped up in your house and we can't wait to see wrestlers again and all that. I think that plays some part in the fans giving Goldberg the response that WWE desires is the fact that the, the pandemic, right? Everyone's cooped up. They want to get out and they're appreciative of WWE and it's massive star power. Goldberg is a big star, whether you love him or hate him. He is a big star. That's really not up for debate. He's a big star. And you you put that together with excitement of being there and that you know Goldberg has very limited dates, that you feel like you're there for something special, and you're going to get a positive response. Even if Goldberg has no business logically being in this story and that he is entitled every time he comes in to just get a championship match is ridiculous. It's patently ridiculous that we are supposed to believe that Goldberg at 50 some years old comes in and is automatically awarded a title shot. It's ridiculous. And fans should boo this. And they don't. And they don't. And you know what? If they don't in Vegas, so be it. I think it'd be a beautiful thing to see. It would be a beautiful, beautiful thing to see and hear Goldberg getting booed out of the arena only if to hear what Vince McMahon does. You know, I'd love to see his reaction, but I don't think we'll get that. I think we'll get a mixed reaction at best now, maybe 50, 50 at, you know, and that may be even wishful thinking, but that's the only reason I can think of as I try to plant my brain in the fans body in attendance is, are are those the reason, those are the reasons why Goldberg is cheered. So whatever, cheer for who you want. I don't care. I'm not trying to talk you out of cheering for Goldberg. You like him. Great. Um, you know, I'm not, a, not a big fan, not a big fan. So Goldberg ends up getting the best of Bobby Lashley after, you know, uh, his, his son cage was at ringside and Goldberg said to cage as he's at ringside, you know, you're the reason I came out of retirement watching Goldberg is one thing, but seeing me live is another, right? I, I came out of this for you and MVP cut a good promo as he always does. Same with Bobby, who cut, you know, a fine promo. He goes to attack Goldberg, and he ducks, and he gets a pretty weak spear. I mean, there was almost no momentum to the spear. It was kind of a tackle. So, I mean, I would say it was like a double leg takedown at best. To call it a spear is not doing a spear justice, but fine. We're in pro wrestling land. It's a spear. Bobby Lashley goes down, doesn't stay down long, and just looks angered. And Goldberg walks up the ramp with his son fine. Uh, whatever. I mean, it's, it's what you expect. It's what you expect on the go home show. Some physicality after the two big stars come face to face and one, you just get one finish, uh, one finisher hit on one guy. And, um, that's usually it. And I think that's actually what we're going to see at SmackDown this week. 
maybe with uh, Roman Reigns or, or rather John Cena hitting the AA on Roman Reigns. And uh, that, that's probably what we'll see. That's my guess is we'll see a parallel situation over on SmackDown Friday night. So that's it was fine. You know, I, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and uh, crap on this program anymore. You guys know how I feel about it. And maybe you love it. And, you know, more power to you. More for real. So, all right. Well, let's let's move on to something that made my heart glow. It made my heart just flutter. I mean, I was I was panting. I was elated. I was on cloud nine because of the audience reaction to Nikki uh, A.S.H. I'll just call her Nikki. Easier. The reaction to Nikki seems to be finally souring. And as it should be, <clears throat> it should be souring to a level of disgust by the fans. And you know what? <clears throat> Excuse me. Nikki could turn this into a great heel character. You may say, how? She's so fun-loving and and go-getter and, and positive. Yeah, but that's the very thing that could turn her heel if she continues to ramp that up. No matter what happens to her, you know, she could turn this up. And she could even say, you know, I'm not like all of you. You know, I, I've got my confidence and she, you know, she she could continue to just be sickfully enthralled and enveloped with her own her own ego and her own confidence, perceived confidence that the fans are going to start to turn on. And she could she could keep her same temperament, her same outfit, her same music, her same promo style and cadence. Just add insults into that promo. That makes it make it just so infuriating and so uh, just annoying that you want to see somebody beat her up. That somebody over this overconfident and this positive does not exist. So <clears throat> it's it's going to be, I, I think, a disaster for Nikki at SummerSlam. I really believe she is going to get booed heavily. I think this was an earmark and a trend rather. I think it's a trend that's going to continue all the way through Saturday night, especially when you get a pay-per-view crowd, the, the quote unquote, more hardcore audience, the core of WWE. When you reach that point, I think you're, you're going to get the real guttural response. I think it's going to be fairly negative for Nikki. I think it'll be 75, 25 in, in favor of booing Nikki. And I'm sure she's sitting, sitting there. If this is not their intent, then you know, then, then good, because I want them to understand that this type of character does not belong in a babyface role, nor does it belong on wrestling at all. I mean, not at all, but if it is their intent to turn her heel by doing this, then it's working. And when she faced Rhea Ripley, Rhea Ripley didn't really cut a promo. She stayed off the mic, which I think is best for her right now. Um, and I think that having her face Nikki is a contrast of styles in, in terms of you have somebody who's just raw, uncut, uh, somebody that is knows who she is, has confidence, real confidence, not perceived, and looks very different from Nikki. And then you have Nikki who is coming out with this false bravado coming out with this costume that basically says if you if you wear if you just wear this costume you can almost be a superhero. Yeah, well unfortunately that's not how life works there sweetheart. And it's 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 very transparent. So those type of styles you're going to go with what are you going to gravitate towards as a human being? The more real person. Even if it's a person you don't like, at least they're authentic. That is exactly where we're at with Nikki. People are starting to see through this garbage. That she only has one emotion. She's one dimensional. One dimensional. Where no matter what happens to her, when she cuts the promo before she goes out, when she's in Gorilla, she cuts the promo about how how positive she is and how she learned her lesson and you know that uh, she just takes the positive from whatever situation she was in. She finds a silver lining in it and she moves on and uh, she talks about her confidence. There's always the word confidence. There's almost uh, ins inspirational. There's always uh, the, the feel good part of her promo that it may, I mean, it really turns my stomach, but you, 
you, you, you wrap all that together and people are going to go, okay, Nikki, then that was fun for a little while. Uh, we, this isn't real. Like nobody's like this and this is not real. <laughs> so I think fans and I can't wait are going to crap all over her on, and I don't mean that on a personal level. I, I like Nikki's wrestling ability. I just think her character is the only problem right here. Like, I think she's good. She was fine the way she was. And they had to throw this silliness on her. But on top of all, you wrap all that together. The other side of this, when you look at it, is two words, Becky Lynch. Uh, you, you throw that in there with fans expecting Becky Lynch to be there. Man, you don't want to. You don't even want to be in the arena if your name is not Becky Lynch in the women's division Sunday or Saturday night because the fans are going to explode if Becky Lynch returns. No matter who's in front of her, they will get booed. And I, I really hope it's not Nikki because if Nikki is face to face with Becky, I mean, I can't imagine that. That's not the that's not the the picture you want. You know, it's not the headline you want. You'd rather have it Becky and Charlotte. Yes, we've seen that a hundred times, but it's been a couple of years now. Or even Rhea, Becky. That's a new matchup that we haven't seen, and I think that'd be fun. So I'm looking forward to that, and uh, hopefully we get away from this fantasy land that makes me want to vomit. That is Nikki. So that I'm looking forward to. And and you know what? High five to all however many thousand people were in attendance on Monday night. I'm giving you all a high five. All of you, simultaneously, cyber high fives. I mean, at a boy or at a girl. So uh, excellent, excellent stuff. So uh, anyway, let's continue on here with the storyline that was woven throughout the show and pretty nicely, which was RK Bro. And Randy Orton ends up opening the show and seems to still have no interest and didn't again give a reason why he RKO'd Matt Riddle and still didn't give an explanation why he was gone for two months. We still don't have that. It's as if we did. The writers don't give you anything with Randy and I don't want to hear that. It's uh, well, that's just kind of the person he is. No, but we, we can still learn about him and have him keep his persona. We don't need to have him recreate the wheel. I just don't. It's lazy. It's laziness. It's all it is. It's laziness. When I hear somebody, or when I hear a talent come out and say, I don't owe you an explanation, and then they stand on that and we actually don't get one, that's not, to me, that's not heat on the character or on the individual. That's heat on the company. That's heat on creative. Because that tells me that creative had nothing for that individual to tell the audience and give them an answer, or they didn't have the balls to come up with an answer to stick to it. So they just went with a cop out of, oh, well, uh, you know, I'm a bad guy and uh, that you don't deserve an answer. No, 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 no. Don't. That's called an incomplete story. That's called incomplete, lazy writing. So, uh, again, we got we're 0 for 2 on Randy Orton explanations. And I don't need to hear that he's a heel and he doesn't need to explain it to us. No, B.S., BS. And speaking of BS, apparently that's a PG word now. Uh, anybody else remember a time where saying that the, the, the BS word would have actually constituted your parents shutting off the television at, you know, the, the young age of like, I don't know, seven to 14, 15. I remember that time. I remember a time where that would be constituted as a rated R uh, a rated R element of a movie or a TV show. Maybe it's PG 13. Maybe as I got older, it started to disintegrate into, uh, more being allowed in those types of movies, PG 13 TV, PG, you know, but it, once they get an okay, I guess for certain language being in a show, they seem to want to just incorporate it. I don't, I don't know, but having Goldberg say BS, it just, it made you look at this as a sign of the times, didn't it? At least for me, because I said, wow. Um, and this isn't the first time they've done it, but I said, I couldn't imagine if I was watching TV with my parents, say 10 years old, I'll split the difference, 10, 11 years old. And I'm watching wrestling and they're begrudgingly letting me watch wrestling. And 
they're cool with it because at least it's TVPG. And there's certainly worse stuff out there. And TVPG, you would assume, would mean, all right, there's some mild language. There's some subject, suggestive situations. There's some violence because it's wrestling, but it's manageable. There's no blood. And then you hear Goldberg say, you know, BS. It's like, my parents would shut off the TV so fast. Uh, I don't know. And I didn't grow up in a super strict household, but man, oh man, uh, just things have certainly changed in terms of definitions, but uh, definitions of TV ratings anyway. But this storyline was woven very nicely through the show. And Randy continuing to defy Matt Riddle, continuing to say no, when clearly the crowd wanted it. It it was a continuous, uh, very high support for this storyline. And that was cool to see that it carried over and it wasn't just, it wasn't just a one-off in one town, one night that it did continue. And I think fans genuinely want to see RK bro together. I do. And this is coming from a guy that couldn't stand, couldn't stand riddle when he was on his own, but he has fallen into this dopey, lovable, great in ring dude that fits perfectly with the serious, dangerous Randy Orton. It's a great matchup. And I was very, very concerned that when they did the RKO last week, initially I thought, oh man, what are they doing? Just to get Randy in a singles role? They they understand the merchandise they could squeeze out of this. They're a for-profit company. Making money should be at the forefront. As evil as some people may perceive that to be, that's how they survive is by making money. So... I was concerned, and then I um, I thought about it more, and I'm thinking, eh, I don't know if he really turned heel, and lo and behold, he didn't really turn heel. Um, and, and, of course, we got AJ and Omas who interrupt, and uh, it turns out to be AJ Styles versus Riddle to start the show. You know, as good of a match as you could expect for the time they were given, two professionals, and it ended with uh, the Styles clash with... AJ getting the clean victory. Randy Orton was nowhere to be found. He left Riddle early in the match. And then Riddle said in an interview backstage that he was just sad, just sad, you know? And it, yeah, it, it did make you a little bit concerned that Randy wasn't coming back. But uh, certainly we, we, we saw differently later in the night when uh, Randy Orton went one-on-one with Omas. I guess we've landed on Omas, by the way. I don't know why they don't just change his name spelling so we can all just get on the same page. If it's pronounced Omas, why is it O-M-O-S instead of O-M-A-S? If we're going to pronounce it Omas and stop uh, deliberating this, just change the letter. (laughs) I I don't know. So I guess we've all landed on Omas, although you you hear the occasional Omos. You do, even on Raw. So... But Randy Orton and Omas was fine uh, for, for, you know, a guy that is as big as he is and as limited as he is, I think still did a serviceable job against Randy Orton. A short match that ended in a disqualification because AJ Styles was caught kicking Randy Orton in the ribs was, uh, was fine. And, you know, it didn't last too long, as I said. But having Omas not get an RKO um, was frustrating for me in a good way. And what I mean by that is I want to see what happens to Omas when he gets hit with a finisher. I don't think he's ever been hit with a finish. I don't think he has. So I want to see what happens when Randy finally gets his hands on Omas and is able to deliver the RKO, which may happen at SummerSlam. I, I want to see what happens. Does he pop back up like the Fiend? Like what happens? How does he sell it? Because he has been yet to take yet to be taken off of his feet. So, uh, I think the matchup that was created on Raw for SummerSlam is the match that we all wanted, which is for the Raw Tag Team Championships: AJ Styles and Omos versus Riddle and Randy Orton. And I expect a very good match. Yes, Omos is limited, but I don't care. I don't need everybody doing the same thing with the same wrestling style. Omos is like a palate cleanser when he comes in, meaning he changes things up. He doesn't taste like everybody else, feel like everybody else's style of wrestling. That's fine. You, you, there are, there's places like 
uh, for these guys in wrestling. So I'm, I'm a big supporter of Omos. Don't get me wrong. And I think he's got bright days ahead and he's getting the heat that he desires. Even AJ Styles is getting the heat that he desires. So um, this should be a fun matchup at SummerSlam. Very interested to see who comes out on top. Um, I'll leave my thoughts as far as predictions go until Thursday night's show with Ashley. So, but but I will say though, I did enjoy the uh, the whole reunion of Randy Orton and and uh, and Riddle because Randy Orton acknowledged that he turned his back on Riddle. He acknowledged that he RKO'd him. He turned his back on him. He walked away from him. And he's still here, and he said he earned his respect before saying that RK Bro is back. And that's where, of course, we got the announcement of who was going to face Styles and Omas for the tag titles at SummerSlam. They have such good chemistry. I got they're such an odd pairing, but they're they've got such good chemistry, and the crowd loved it. You know what it reminded me of? Those of you that are old enough to remember. Man, I sound old saying that. But in 2006, when the Spirit Squad were going against Shawn Michaels and Triple H individually, and with Shawn and Triple H uniting to fight a common enemy, they by default reformed DX. And I remember that feeling for weeks of them, of the fans wanting to see it, wanting to see it, wanting to see it. And they finally delivered it and the crowd exploded. It, it reminded me of this, not as big of a pop, but certainly respectable and significant. And that's what it reminded me of. So it was, it was a nice moment. I still kind of expected the RKO a little bit, and I don't know what the end game is with these two. You know, if they end up winning the tag titles, does riddle or is riddle the one to turn on Randy eventually and say, you know, I took all your crap. I'm the reason that we're together. I mean, riddle could turn heel on this whole thing eventually. Because we've seen Randy turn heel a million times on his opponent or on his teammates. So that wouldn't really be a fresh new story for Randy. It would just kind of be the same old, same old. So I don't know. If you were going to ask me right now on August 17th, 2021, I would say that eventually riddles the one that turns on Randy. But what do I know at this point? All right. So a good moment there. Good moment. Um, What else happened? Uh, Drew McIntyre defeated Veer and Shanky via pinfall in a handicap match when McIntyre pinned Shanky with a Claymore. This means that Veer and Shanky are barred from ringside at SummerSlam. I like it. I, th- I think that's good. You know, I, 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 I don't need Veer and Shanky interfering in this. Assuming that Drew McIntyre plows through Jinder Mahal, what's next for him? You know, I, I do wonder. I do wonder what's next for Drew, I got to say. Or maybe this continues and we have Heath Slater as part of the three-man band come back. I mean, who knows? They could do some wacky crap. If Veer and Shanky are the ones who are barred, then who else is eligible? I mean, just just some thoughts there. But I think Drew has done nice on the mic. He's shown passion. He's shown that he can you know, have a little bit of a sense of humor on the microphone and I appreciate him trying to shake things up a little bit in his character. It did feel like it needed a big, big change and not just from the WWE title picture, but just kind of in general. And he's added his sword and he's told us why he's named it Angela. He's shown a little bit more humor and not just a screaming promo all the time. He's showing a range. Even if it's small, I appreciate that. I got to say, that's how you keep things feeling a little bit new and ahead of the curve. So... Uh, good stuff there. I mean, I, I know that most people aren't looking forward to this. I'm looking forward to Drew knocking the head off of, uh, of, of gender. I really am. All right. So Damian Priest faces off against the Miz after hitting the brogue kick. So this happened when Miz was John Morrison's guest on, dare I say, Moist TV and accidentally revealed to Morrison that he'd been cleared to wrestle for weeks leading to Morrison to suggest Priest versus Miz. And despite Miz protesting the idea it happened anyway, um, Sheamus was on commentary, forced to watch his SummerSlam opponent steal his move to score the win. Miz and Morrison patched up their relationship later in the show. That's the rundown from CBS Sports. Credit where credit's due. So, 
Uh, Damian Priest, can he get the hell away from the Miz? Can we please, for all that is holy, get Damian Priest out of the conversation with the Miz and Morrison? And while we're at it, can we get rid of his clapping maneuver? You guys know what I'm talking about. The behind the head, I'm going to clap my hands in front of your face, Simon says, maneuver. That it would do exactly zero damage. Now, I guess the idea is to smash your biceps or forearms into the side of the head of your opponent and you happen to clap your hands, but there's too much emphasis on the clapping and not enough emphasis on you know trying to actually hit your opponent. So I don't know, I'm just nitpicking here, but I'm not a fan of his clapping maneuver. I know it sounds nice, and it, I guess visually, you, if you don't think about it more than a second, you'd go, oh, okay, cool move. If you think about it for two seconds or more, you're like, uh, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. <laughs> so anyway, I'm a, I, I like Damian Priest. I just think, and I've said this since WrestleMania, that he needs to get away from the Miz. For please, for the love of God, please. But Damian Priest ends up defeating Miz via pinfall after hitting the bro kick, as I said, um, using Sheamus's bro kick. Where Sheamus sat ringside watching Damian Priest do this, which just enraged Sheamus. And uh, Sheamus continues to wear his steel plated mask, which is hilarious. And having his hair matted down is nice. I gotta say, I don't need Sheamus in the in the Mohawk anymore. So good stuff there. And we'll have to see how that match pans out. But uh, I think we all kind of know where it's leading. Alexa Bliss and Lily, the doll, scared off Dewdrop. So again, this was not a Hulu special, but let me read the description. Dewdrop tried to confront Bliss and her doll on Alexa's playground, but when she took the doll from Bliss, Dewdrop looked at it. Uh, with a concerned expression before handing it back and leaving. That's it. So she picks up a doll, looks at it, and uh, hands it back. She gets paid, uh, probably, assumingly, hundreds of thousands of dollars every year to show up to a a place, show up to, where were they this week? Was it Tulsa? No, I, I forget the name of the place they were this week. Show up there. Get on a plane, pack her clothes, you know, do all this effort, get to the arena. What are you doing today? Oh, I'm going to look at a doll and hand it back. Uh, oh, okay. (laughs) I mean, think about that. I don't know. Mansoor defeats Mace via pinfall after interference from Mustafa Ali. Mace had Mansoor pinned when Ali had a drop kick to allow Mansoor to reverse the pin. So, um... I mean, I, I you talk about lower card. This to me isn't even on my 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 radar at all. So I don't know what to say about this. I, I will say though that Mustafa Ali is a hell of a talent, especially on the microphone, and he has a good presence. It's just a shame that him as the leader of Retribution went exactly nowhere. And it really is a shame because I I really enjoy Mustafa Ali on the microphone. But uh, Mansoor defeating Mace does this mean anything? I think you guys know the answer to that. Karrion Cross defeats Jeff Hardy via submission with the cross jacket. So, again, another week where Karrion Cross takes care of Jeff Hardy. Uh, Cross attacked Hardy backstage before the match, leading to a very short match once he came to the ring. So, this didn't last long. But those of you, again, I said this last week, I'll say it again because I got bombarded with people freaking out about Karrion Cross losing his big raw debut match to Jeff. Have we all forgotten about that now that Karrion has beat up Jeff several times and beat him several times already? I think we've all forgotten. Yeah, so I I have no worries about Karrion Cross. Okay, Charlotte Flair and Nia Jax defeat Rhea Ripley and Nikki via pinfall. After Flair hit Ripley with the natural selection... Flair was given an opportunity to have a tag match after being upset with the post-match attack earlier in the night. Jax had the match won when Flair tagged him, tagged herself in to steal the pin. So, uh, I, I, I really, you know, when you look at this, when you look at these four women, there are no clear-cut baby faces or heels, for that matter. 
Uh, for real. I mean, everybody's so ambiguous in this fatal four way of, of a tag team match. Charlotte, I don't, I still don't understand why she's a heel because she tells people to bow to her shallow. So five years ago, doesn't mean anything now. Nia Jax floating in obscurity, um, had a nice run with Shayna Baszler as the, one of the half, one half of the women's tag team champions. Uh, and then you have Rhea Ripley, who was heel face, heel face, heel face, heel face, taking a page out of the page, taking a page out of the big show book. And then Nikki, who is a baby face, but starting to get a negative reaction as the crowd starts to get sick of her positivity. So again, I don't know what to think of this because I don't know who to feel invested in. Um, I, I guess Flair, but I don't like Nia Jax. I also... Again, this is very convoluted. It felt like just kind of a time filler, honestly. But Flair getting the victory after stealing the pin is expected. And she is exactly what she says she is. She's the opportunity. So why wouldn't she take the opportunity to win the match? Pretty easy. Pretty easy. So uh, that is really Monday Night Raw. I'm trying to think, think if I missed anything. And let's see here. I'm looking through some of the notes, some of the screenshots. Um, I, I really don't, you know, we heard the word momentum. You'll continue to hear the word momentum, especially before a pay-per-view, because it means exactly nothing, but we hear it anyway because it sounds like a big, important word, and it's not. So, again, I'm looking forward to this Friday night on SmackDown because of the perceived maybe face-off again with John and Roman and likely a physic, uh, some physicality, albeit limited. And yes, oh yes, AEW's Dynamite Rampage in Chicago, it, I think should be a very rocking night. And one that could break the internet. I will say that. I, I have very high confidence that CM Punk will make his debut. And uh, AJ Styles, or AJ Styles, I'm looking at a picture of him right now. Uh, Vince McMahon is going to go, whoops, we should have signed him. Uh, I don't know if they ever went after him. Reports are that they didn't and didn't care enough or even consider it. And I think they'll rue the day that they didn't because CM Punk is going to change the game of professional wrestling. He is going to be trending on Twitter for like a week. Uh, he's trending on Twitter you know, on and off all the time right now as it is, putting out cryptic messages and things like that. It's going to be... Uh, a, a wild night in Chicago on Friday night, just flat out wild. Uh, I'll end with one note on Keith Lee. I'll end with no one note on that because I did watch his six to seven minute explanation of what the hell's been going on since January. And it is fairly close to what I had, had expected as to what's going on. And that's health. Uh, partially I thought it was health, but I thought it was cash. I thought it was creative. Uh, it ended up, according to him, just being health. And if you haven't seen it, by the way, go search for uh, Keith Lee on YouTube. Keith Lee uh, explains his absence or something like that. It'll pop right up. It's like six, seven minutes. And uh, it all had to do with his health and COVID and his heart and uh, all that kind of thing. I guess it was he had an enlarged heart or something like that. And it ended up getting pretty scary for a while things resolve themselves and he seems to be fairly back to normal. And, you know, I think that's great for him, but according to him, it was 100% health related. So uh, if that is indeed to be the case and I'll take him at face value, then we wish him all the best in his continued recovery. And hopefully at some point a continuous presence on our TV screens. Not just, yeah, I'm here for a couple of days. I'll see you in five months type of deal. And I'm not blaming him for it, but I'd rather have him go full bore than kind of touch here and there. And I'll be back maybe here if I can come back for a night or two and then I'll go away for four weeks. No, no, no. Like, I think we want Keith Lee and we want him consistently on our TVs, uh, not just, you know, a, a sporadic, a sporadic time. So there is your Monday Night Raw review, everybody. Again, we have an ad-free experience over at Patreon and a shout-out and Discord server for during the pay-per-view, which is always a blast. Or on Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe ad-free by clicking the ad-free button on our page. 
and keep it here for your SummerSlam uh, coverage and review and reactions, all that stuff. And also, Anthony DeMarco and I just finished recording a what if uh, on what if WWE ended the brand split today and what if Nia Jax joined the bloodline. It's a dual show that we didn't mean to be a dual show, but it was. And it was really fun talking with him. I recorded with him just before I started this raw review. And I think you'll enjoy that. It'll be dropping Thursday. So Thursday morning, when you get up, that will be in your list to, uh, to get you through your work day. So everybody, thanks so much. Again, if you want to be included in the mailbag tomorrow, hit us up on email, real WWE podcast at gmail.com or you can call us. Those of you that want to call us and leave a voicemail can get your voice on the show. 518-952-0247. All right, everybody. That's it for me today. I hope everybody has a great day, great week. Get yourself ready for SummerSlam by sticking right here. Click that subscribe button and I'll talk to you next time.